Let's start with the basics. We're going to briefly cover today configuring the initial properties to turn on change models. The plugin comes out of the box with newer instances, or you may have to enable it, but there still are some properties that have to be turned on for any of it to actually be visible to the users. And there are some things that we'll talk about very briefly to keep an eye on if you're coming from an older instance. If certain versions have not been updated on workflows and, and anything associated with change, there could be some issues trying to use them before you make those configurations. Then we've also, we'll just go through very quickly uh, what it looks like to create a change model, create an approval policy, and then some of the workflows and a flow designer flow tie-ins to the change models. So there are three properties you should know. They're not on the change properties page, which is kind of interesting to me, but it wouldn't be that hard to add them into the category to get them to show there. Out of the box there, you do have to go look them up on the sys property table. And the three that you would need to care about have the words change underscore model in them. The first one, type compatibility, is what tells the system whether you want to try to use your existing type structure, the, the normal way of doing change where you, you use the type field to determine whether it's a normal emergency or standard change or any other types you might have customized. If you want to run this in addition to change model, then you would turn that property to true. And then the second property, the hide property, decides whether you want to leave the legacy in interceptor visible to the user. Or if, if you set the, so if you set hide to true, it leaves the legacy interceptor. If you set hide to false, it will tack on your change models at the end of the interceptor. But I've also come to find out that that is a completely separate interceptor that just looks exactly like the legacy one with the addition of the change models. So it doesn't keep the changes, any changes that you've made or customizations to the original interceptor will not appear there. You would have to go customize the new one as well. But when I demonstrate it, I'll show you that it just pops up that interceptor with a, a tagline at the end that says, if you wanna go look at change models, you can click this link and then it'll take you to the change model view. If you turn off the first property for type compatibility, then it's only gonna take the user to the list of change models and they will no longer have an option to select the old type uh, legacy models. And this last one, I actually asked ServiceNow about this one. Basically their response was, leave it to true because this is really only relevant for coming from very old instances that used a very old management functionality for workflow and required the script include to go delete old workflows when new ones are attached to a workflow and some other things like that. So in most cases, you'd have to leave this to true. If you are trying to come into Quebec from a pretty old instance, you might need to just investigate this property to make sure it's not relevant to you. But the newer functionality is supported by just leaving this to true. So quickly, we'll go through configuring a change model because it's more important, I think, that I show you how to do this. The change model intent is to move to a fit to purpose design. So I'm sure any one of you who has actually done a change implementation in the past has either customized the solution or wished you had a solution for a way to more dynamically determine the state flow of a change. They've also added in the, within the last few versions, they had added the state models script include that was an extension of an out of the box script include where you could put a function that, tell, that told the change go here, you know, allow them to go from new to assess and to authorize, but not to implement or things of that nature. You could decide which st states could come first and which ones could come second, but it was all script based and not exactly user friendly. This is the next step in that evolution. It's more data-driven and customizable and allows you to create your own models on top of your types if you want. You can actually have multiple models to a single normal change, but it will help you determine the state flow uh, in a pretty clean and user-friendly fashion. Something that I wouldn't necessarily say 
that just any business user could just jump in and figure out, but it does simplify it to a, to a level where you're not going to need advanced developers designing your change process. So if you're here, you just have a very basic change model record that you can customize. You can put the record presets, which just determines which fields get auto-populated with which data. And when you set these, they get set to read only. So be careful what you put in here and make sure it's not something that you want the user to be able to modify later. Uh, there is a simple script you can disable that does this actual read-only piece of it, but it is customization. So that's, you know, that's between you and your client. And then very simple configurations, like do you want it available and create new? That's the, the interceptor that you're going to see later that shows the list of change models for the users. You just are deciding if you want it to show up in that list for them or not. It could still be accessible if it's active via the APIs, but it's not going to show up as an option to the users. And then you can have it set as a default change model in the case where you're not giving them a lot of options to select models. One thing I would note here is that we've discovered that, that currently there seems to be a bit of an oversight. There's not an, a simple way to assign even a role to who can see a particular change model. So basically, if you create a change model, it's going to show up in that that catalog of change models and it's going to be available to the users. You could do some things that are a little wonky, like script on the actual change form that says if it's, if it's this type of user, they can't see certain things on this change model or they're not allowed to select it, but it would definitely not, not be a clean solution. So as far as restricting change models, at least right now, um, what you create is what they get. And you have to be careful to not create something that's custom for just a single group and try to display it for only that group, at least at, at this time. I would hope that in a later iteration, that would be something we would consider. Model states is a related list on the change model form. And it, this is where you do all the, the meat of the work for telling your change model what states to make available and what the transitions can look like. In the slideshow, I'm not going to delve into the transitions too, too much, but we can look at those in the demo portion. The list of model states is just that. If anything that you add here will show up on the change if that model is applied. If it's not here, it will not show up. And then as you dig into the model states, you can give it transition options for each state, other state that exists. So you could say that new allows the user to go to assess authorized scheduled, if that's something you wanted to do. You can have canceled as an option for all states. All of those transitions can be defined per state. And then you can even apply conditions. And uh, when we get into that, I'm gonna actually show you that you can also set up uh, automatic transitions. So you could have a state that's available such as authorized, but you could make it unavailable to the user to select the scheduled state from authorized and you could force it into scheduled once the approval is complete. Uh, and I have a few examples of that that we'll get into. You can also, yeah, you can have condition-based and automated transitions. And then the transitions, the only thing to keep in mind about the automatic transitions is that the, it has to be triggered via a flow action and this flow action called evaluate change model as far as i've been able to tell does not that is the one thing that does not exist in workflow editor that does exist in flow designer for almost everything i'm going to show you you could run a workflow in parallel but automatic transitions rely on that that model evaluation activity and it is not anywhere to be found in the workflow editor you might be able to script something to mimic that, but it's not out of the box. So as part of this, I wanted to go over change approval policies, even though they are they were available before Quebec, they are a pretty key piece of this whole process because this is what breaks out the approvals from workflow and makes them more dynamic and data driven. So when you define your change approval policy, that form is pretty simplistic. It's just telling you to decide if you want to evaluate multiple decisions, which we'll get into what the decisions are, but it, essentially each decision manages one approval or approval group that could be applied to a change. So you can decide if you want to have it even potentially apply multiple when this approval policy runs, or if you only want it to do 
the first match for a decision and then that approval group or approval user will be assigned and, and no other ones will be evaluated and you can manage that through order. So we're gonna to get to the decisions tab in a second. We'll look at what that looks like. But you can also create your own policy inputs. So generally in the decisions for approval policies, you're gonna to have to choose from fields on the change. It's a very data-driven and it only has this change request object out of the box that you can use to, to drill into and say, well, I only want changes that are of this type and of this model to have this approval policy applied in this state and with this field populated with this value. Those are the kinds of conditions you can do just simply out of the box, but you also have the additional option to add your own inputs that are completely customized. So for example, I just had this test policy input that I put in here that does, it does absolutely nothing on its own, but I can go into my workflow or I can go into my flow designer flow and define what that value is based on any criteria. So I could go out and do a glide record query, or I could do a simple evaluation of another record some, and somewhere else in the system or of something uh, on a related list to the change that I can't get to directly by just dot walking through the change record. I can use any other criteria to evaluate whether this equals true or false. This is a script type that you can have the, as you see here, you can have a true or false, you can have strings, you can put any type of variable you want. And they do show a little bit differently in flow designer versus workflow editor. So I can briefly demonstrate that as well. Um, but this is where you're gonna get the flexibility to have stronger conditions than, than just what's happening on the change. And then the decisions I talked about earlier, this is the criteria that you're gonna sort through when you apply a change approval policy. So you would, in your flow, you're gonna have an activity that says, run this change approval policy. If I go back here, the, you have your approval policy defined, but you could have all of these decisions tied to the normal change approval policy. And all of them could be evaluated every time you run that activity. But because you have order that you can define, there's an order column here, and then you can actually have it fall through each set of conditions and either run everything that matches or run only one of the ones that matches. You can decide what things need to run depending on even what state the, the uh, change is in. And then the next time you need to do an evaluation, you have that activity run again, and it will use the new criteria to determine which one should be applied. Any questions up to this point? Can approvals be added to various states or is it just in the um, authorized and assessed state? They can actually be added in any state because you're only basing it on your condition. The one thing I would caution you about is in the authorized state, there's very specific conditions such as approval being set to approved that make it easier for you to prevent the change from going forward or control what the user is able to do before it hits that gateway. You have to make sure, just like with any change, you have to make sure that you're not setting the approval field too early or too late. And once that's set, you won't have that as a criteria anymore because if you're two states past that, then it's been approved that whole time. It really doesn't tell you whether that change is allowed to move forward. So it just comes down to, everything is down to how you want to set your gateways for the user, but you just have to make sure you have a way to keep them from moving forward until some sort of criteria is met. And that okay. may be done from the flow or that may be done from a field on the form. It's just up to you. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right, we'll get into the meat of things. I'm sorry if this is a little bit hard to read, but I'm actually gonna go open up the, uh, at least the uh, flow designer flow through the demo. So you'll be able to see it more closely. The main thing I wanna call out here is that there are out of the box flows that support both, or that there are both types that support both change models and change the legacy change types. The thing I mentioned earlier 
comes into play here, where if you're coming from an old instance, if you've made any customizations to your change flows, you will need to go and check to make sure that your change flows have accepted the latest update from Quebec. If they have not, they won't have a, a very important condition in the condition field that checks to see if state model is empty. If the state model is empty, the change flow will run. But if the uh, state model is populated, the, the flow designer flow will run. If that condition doesn't exist, then both of them will run at the same time. And you will see all sorts of funky things happen to your change uh, because it's running two different sets of criteria. And if, especially if it's an old flow that has been customized in any way and maybe doesn't have the change approval policies applied to it, then you could have multiple approvals being added from different places and weird state transitions and things that won't look right. The other thing to check for in your flow is that it's not as late, as recent as Quebec, but in a, a couple of versions back, the workflows were updated to include the change approval policy decisions here. And in lieu of the out of the box workflow activities that add an approval directly to the form. So those two things need to be, really need to be in place for you to continue using your workflows and flow designer flows congruently. If you do that, then you can maintain your old workflow and continue to use it and use the property that I'm, I mentioned earlier that I'll show you to allow them to do both at the same time and let them choose which one they wanna do. And then if they choose a model, it will run the flows attached to the model. If they choose the workflow, then it will do the workflows. You could also put the same structure in place in uh, workflows and run workflows for change models. But as I said, you won't be able to do the automatic transitions with an out of the box activity. So the, the, that limitation would have to be kept in mind if you wanted to continue using a uh, workflow editor instead of flow designer. All right, we'll just get right into the a bit. I'm first gonna just pull up my change model. I did a test change model to demonstrate some of the key features that I think are beneficial from the change models. You can see out of the box, you're gonna have normal, standard, and emergency, unauthorized, is based on some of the newer features for change that allow you to generate unauthorized changes if a CI has been modified without permission. And um, that's something you can get into in a, in a different share of the wealth. But there's also this type here that I, I consider a little bit unfortunate being a proponent of the change process overall, but I have also unfortunately already had a use case where a, a company needed access to a change type like this. And essentially out of the box, they've provided you a, what I like to call a non-change change that goes straight to review and lets the user just fill it out retroactively. So the other way you can think of this is just an informational change, which is fine with the, with limitations around it if that's something that that is a need for your company. But again, I remind you that you can't put role restrictions on these. So when you put an, a change registration change in the in the catalog, that's open to everybody. And so it would be a, a training situation where you do you would have to make sure that people are not just submitting these change registrations to avoid the change process. Uh, so there would have to be some process restrictions around that. Uh, luckily, it's not active. It's not available in create new out of the box. It is only there if you want to activate it for your users later. The three that are available are typically emergency, normal, and standard. My test model, I wanted to go in and, and demonstrate a couple things for uh, automatic transitions. And then also as far as the assess state, which is supposed to be for kind of an internal evaluation before you get into the authorized state where you're gonna have CAB approvals and things like that. There's also a, a, a nifty little feature you can use to uh, kind of play around with that a little bit more instead of having it just be an approval. So I mentioned that you've got your record presets. That's pretty straightforward. You've got your, your model states and you determine which one's gonna be the initial state. 
and that will be the state that your change enters as soon as it's created. Then if you drill into the state, you get access to all of your state transitions. And as you can see, I've already given it two, but I can choose any of my available states as a transition and I can decide if it's going to be automatic or if it needs to be moved to manually. And then within each state transition, I can also define a condition which would determine whether it's allowed to move forward into that new state. Now, these are all predefined conditions. So rather than building the condition builder in here, they've, they've put them into this change model condition types table. And I can define my condition type and then apply it multiple times to any change models that I want to apply it to. And as you can see here, I can choose a table from change it's only change and change extended tables and then you can choose any of the fields as conditions so they've actually got a couple that are out of the box not on hold it's pretty straightforward on hold isn't checked uh, so you can create your own i have my own test condition that i created for active is true which i will not be using but that was one that I put in there just to show that you can build your own. And then uh, let's go back here, test model. So then each one of these can have a, a specific condition on them. But as I'm going to demonstrate, you can also control a lot of this from the flow. And sometimes it's more it makes more sense to do so. So I'm going to just come over here and show you the create new for uh, change. Actually, let's do this first. Let's pop up that list and we'll look at we'll look at the change model properties and I'll show you what that interceptor looks like. So right now we've got it set to only show the change model page whenever I create new. <clears throat> so if I hit create new here. It's going to take me to this really simple interceptor with all my change models available. I can do pinning. It's a lot like some of the other features that have been introduced over time. It's all the same interface as the uh, notifications that were enhanced recently. So you can pin your own change models and see what only the ones you want to see. The standard change, which we're not getting into today, but all of those standard change templates that get approved show up in the pre-approved list here and can be selected from there as well. Or you can just show all of it together. So this is if I told the system that I'm going to only use change models from this point forward. But let's say that I still have my legacy change that I need to take advantage of. Maybe I've created a custom model for one fringe use case, but I still want to stick to my states to determine most of what's going on. Then I can do this parallel setup where I can have my old change types. And if I select any one of these, it's just going to do the normal flow that we're all used to open a normal change and continue through the process. But if I want, I can still go back to my change models from here. Or I can say, actually, I want to hide the change models from there and I don't even want them to show up. Then I'm right back to my old way of doing things. Um, as far as the user's concerned, if as long as those conditions are set, as I mentioned earlier in the workflow, there's, no, there's not gonna be anything noticeable to the user that indicates that there's a, a now, now a change model process available. Since I wanna have easy access to these, I'm just gonna go ahead and set them back to false. Now, if I go and create from my new model, while I'm doing that, I'm also going to pull up the flow designer so you can see what the flows look like as we go. Now, I've tested this multiple times, so I'm hoping it works out exactly as I expected. But as you know, with things like uh, change, one little 
misclick and all of a sudden uh, nothing works the way as it, it was expected. So hopefully that won't be the case. Here we've got my test model. You can see that the test model or the actual model field is still editable. Uh, this is a client script that's out of the box that says the model field can be editable until you leave the initial state. So I do still have the option to change my model at this point. Once I've once I've moved to the next state in the process, that is not going to be available anymore unless I re revert back to that state. So for now, I've got my new and assess and closed, and these are my only available options. So I want to go straight to assess. I've, I've already figured out what I want. I've filled out all my fields in theory, and I want to just start the process of evaluating my change. So I'm going to do save. So now I'm in the assess state. I'm going to flip over here to my change model, or sorry, my flow designer flow. And the way that these are typically set up, the out of the box ones are very similar to this, is you tie them to the specific state that they're going to run. And then they just kind of trail off when, when all of the criteria have been met for that state. So for example, in my assess, state, instead of giving an approval to developer group or something like that, I chose that I wanted to have a change task created that has some information on internal testing. And I want that change task to be complete before they can move the change to the next state and get authorization. So I've given them an internal testing task. There is an out of the box action now that is just add change task to change but it only allows you to populate the assignment group and everything else gets pre-populated. If you actually open the definition of it, it does a script and pre-populates short description, description, and everything else from the change. So if that's what you want, that's, that's fine. But for me, I wanted to actually have some control over the field. So I just did the create task action instead. And then I'm gonna wait for that task to be inactive or closed. And once that happens, I'm going to do this evaluate change model trigger. All evaluate change model does is check the change that you've specified. So in my case, the one that got created that triggered this flow, it goes back and evaluates it at this moment in time to see if all the criteria are met to do an automatic transition. So I've told it I want it to move in to authorize as soon as this task is closed. So by the design of the system, when I told it it was an automatic transition, it took away my ability to go to authorize. So I can't select it, but I can come in here and close my change task. I'm going to just save here so it refreshes and then go back to my change and I should be in the authorized state now. So it did the transition for me and it was based on my conditions in the flow. And you'll see that the flow attached to this is no longer running because everything I needed it to do has been completed. But now I have an actual authorized flow that's attached that matches these criteria. So once it's been, once it hits that authorized state, now I want it to do a quick check. I've actually told it I have two separate approval policies. One that runs a, uh, if there's an associated incident to this change, it queries for a change that has that, for an incident that has that change in the change field. And then if, it, if it, there is one, then it's going to do a full cab approval. If there is no associated incident, then it's going to do a simple manager approval. So the pathing is set up such that it does its query here, it checks to make sure there's a valid record, and then my change approval policy actually has this associated incident special variable attached to it. And I can show that here. Test model. See, I created a special policy input called associated incidents, and I've given two options, two paths to follow. 
one of them checks to see if my custom variable is false. And then uh, obviously the other one checks to see if it's true and does a different answer for the question. And the answer, you can define your own answers, but in a very simple view, you can give it a user approval, a group approval. You can have it auto approve and reject. You can choose to pull it off of the change or you can choose to do it by just defining who you want to approve. All of that is just standard within the change approval policy, but I'm using that here to help guide my flow. So what I'm gonna do here is actually go open an incident. I'm gonna grab my change number. Pick one that's open. going to drop it in my change request field because that's the one that I'm querying in my flow. So now what I should expect to see, actually I'm already in authorized, so it doesn't matter, but if we went back and did this with a different change, I would expect to see the, the cab approval, but because that incident was not yet associated, we see just the manager approval. And the flow path was, the, was uh, down this this path instead of here. It skipped this section entirely and went to here. And now what it's gonna do is wait for the approval to be completed. So when I approve it, and then it says it's going to evaluate my change model. So if I come back here, my change model was evaluated. It showed that the approval was completed and now it's in the scheduled state as an automatic transition. And then for the rest of it, I, it's pretty straightforward. It gives you the options of states you wanna move through, you can select them, but you could see the flexibility available here where you could actually do things like say, it's not allowed to go into implement until the plan start date has passed. You can put all sorts of little gateways in there to stop it from moving forward or to automatically move it forward when it makes sense. So that's really all I wanted to demonstrate for the overall process. I did want to mention David Self is on the call and uh, he's been working on some implementing some of this in tandem with the portal. So if you do have any interest or questions in how this might look in the portal or if it works at all with the portal, then that would be he would be the right person to talk to on that as I haven't been able to dig into that functionality a lot. All right, well, I appreciate, appreciate you letting me ramble. I hope some of this information was useful. If you have any more questions or anything comes up, feel free to hit me up. Thank you for coming.